Hello and welcome to this event from the British Library. I'm Brett Walsh of the Cultural Events Department and I can't think of a better way to celebrate the summer solstice than with one of Britain's foremost nature writers, Richard Maybe, who's also the award-winning biographer of Gilbert White. Now tonight's discussion is going to be chaired by the historian Rebecca Radil, but before I introduce Rebecca, uh, there's a few points of housekeeping. So if you'd like to purchase a copy of Richard's book on Gilbert White, you can do so using the button just above the video. In that same menu, you'll also find a link to give us your feedback. Your feedback is really important to us, so please do take the time to fill that out. And you can also donate to the British Library. Now, towards the end of the event, we'll be doing a public Q&A. So if you've got a question, just pop it in the form below the video. Um, we're also going to be seeing some items from the library's collection relating to Gilbert White. So we're going to have some um, presentations from our curator, Alex Alt, throughout the event. Now, our chair tonight is Rebecca Radil. She is a historian of early modern England and the director of the History Festival, Hisfest. She is the author of 1666, Plague, War and Hellfire. And she also hosts the history podcast, Killing Time. She is a former television researcher and producer. She developed the award-winning um, David Attenborough's First Life and the BAFTA-winning Flying Monsters with David Attenborough. She's lectured and tutored at University College London, Bath Spa University and Oxford University. So, without further ado, I will hand you over to Rebecca. Thank you. Hello and um, welcome everyone to this evening's event um, and in true British style and I think in keeping with the rest of the 18 months that we've had our summer solstice is actually a very dull and gloomy day but hopefully we can bring you a bit of sunshine and joy this evening to make up for that. Um, so tonight we're going to explore the life and work of Gilbert White known to history as England's first ecologist. He authored perhaps one of the most famous books to come out of the 18th century, The Natural History of Selborne. Now last year marked 300 years since he was born um, and unfortunately because of because of what happened last year it got somewhat overshadowed but hopefully we can make up for that tonight. To tell, to tell his story and unravel um, his life I'm joined by the award-winning nature writer, journalist and the biographer biographer of the Whitbread award-winning Gilbert White, biography of the author of Natural History of Selborne, uh, Richard Maybe. And we're also joined today by Alexandra Alt, um, who has created some lovely short videos that will take you into the British Library's collection, and show you some of um, White's original, original documents. Um, I, 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 my first question, Richard, hi, how are you? Hello. <laughs> um, I've been having a lot of fun going through your um, 1986 book here. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned, and I think we can all kind of empathize with this when we come to a, a new topic is that we're, we're often aware of things or, or there's they're something that, 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 we, that we know of, but we don't necessarily give them um, a lot of attention. And one of the things that you say in, in your introduction to your book is that while Gilbert White was someone that you were aware of and you'd read, you weren't particularly enamoured or intrigued by him to start with. Can you tell me how that changed in the process um, behind putting together your, your book? Yes. Um, when I first attempted to read The Natural History of Selborne, I suppose I was in my, my 20s, and uh, I found it really hard going. Um, the form of the book, um, a series of letters, uh, the language, which at first reading felt to me a little stilted, um, I, I, I kind of saw it as a book of the old school in, in, in very many senses. Um, what changed was that um, I was asked to write an introduction to the natural history for the Penguin Classics Library, which meant I actually had to read it seriously. And the more <laughs> I looked into it, um, the more astounded I was by what an extraordinary literary construction it was, what amazing powers of observation White had and how he was able to translate those in, into words. And also I became fascinated by the man himself. Um, there is a kind of caricature of White um, that floats about 
as a, as a kind of robust, rather simple, innocent country parson. I mean, one of his first nicknames was Parson White. And the more I looked into his, his life, um, the more of a, of a parody this appeared to be of what he was really like. So um, uh, I, I, I think I got to talking about about my interest in him quite a lot, and um, and a good friend of mine who was uh, a director at Penguins at the time said, uh, "Have a go at a biography." So um, I did, and um, it was a, a fascinating few years' work. And boy, did you have a go! I mean, this was 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 so acclaimed when it came out, and it's um, being reissued later on this year as well. So do get yourself a copy. And I want to come back to the process of writing a little bit later on um, in this talk. But before we get there, I wonder if you could maybe paint a picture of White's early life, his family background, and and the world that he was born into. Well, he came um, like very many. Uh, writing folk of the 18th century from a long clerical background. Um, and his family were in, in Hampshire most of the time. Um, and he was brought up in Selborne. Um, he was born in the house he eventually lived in. Um, and what we know very little about his childhood. Uh, uh, what, what one can speculate that he had a lot of time to spend in the in the local landscape, uh, which has been very invigorating for a child, as it is as it was to me when I started discovering it, um, and I, I'm I, I'm fascinated by what that landscape may have imprinted uh, on, on his character, because I think one of the big turning points when I was writing the biography was to actually go down to Selborne, spend a lot of time there, follow White's footsteps, if you like. And the landscape is, is extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's a patch of uh, what the great Oliver Rackham once called ancient countryside, still unchanged very much, um, very up and down, uh, ancient beechwoods, hanging beechwoods, um, boggy forests, um, extraordinary ancient meadows with, with hedgerows. Um, White, White once um, described um, the, the countryside as very abrupt, meaning there were, there were sudden changes from uh, a river valley to a steep hill covered by trees. And I, I felt that in that one word, one had um, an insight into what was to develop in his character and writing, which was an ability to shift the focus of what he was seeing from a backcloth to uh, an extraordinary foreground. I think that's really interesting as you, as you say that word abrupt because often um, when you live in urban areas, I mean, I'm, I'm from Chester, I'm based in Chester at the moment, which isn't a particularly busy city, but you do often associate the countryside with peace and calm. Um, but this, this, um, this idea of it being abrupt and busy is something that's um, that, yeah, that yeah. he shows so well, and, and you do as well yeah. in in your book. So he, so he was born into this life in, in in Selborne. He was surrounded by this countryside and this village, and um, and then he went he went to school. Um, could you tell me about his his how his life led up to him going to to university and what he what he studied when he was there? Well, he studied uh, theology chiefly at, at university as as uh, as a um, a clerical family son would do. Um, it's not clear if he, if he went to any zoology or, or botany classes. They were available just about at Oxford, um, but it's not at all clear that he did. I mean, the, the atmosphere, um, even in the theology classes of, of this moment, I mean, he was born in 1720. He went to Oxford in, what, uh, 1739. Um, and um, he, many of the books he would have read then would have been in the prevailing mode of what was called physico-theology, um, which was uh, almost like an, an intelligent version of uh, uh, you know, creationism, which uh, postulated that the world was as it was because the creator had fitted so many beautiful details together so that by understanding those details, you could begin to understand the mind of the creator. Um, and White, White read a lot of the, the, the authors of this, uh, particularly William Derham. Um, and there was no doubt that, that in some way his intellectual output 
in the intellectual outlook would have been shaped by physico theology. Uh, the, the idea of that close attention to the minute particulars of the world. White began to see it in, in rather different terms than being just an act of devotion, um, but there's no doubt that, that that kindled it. Thing I'd like to say about um, his time at Oxford was that he was a, he was a, a, a typical student. Um, he, he spent a lot of money on booze, on fancy clothes. Um, he went to the concert, he frequented coffee shops, he hung out with poets. Um, it was a, for, a, for a guy who'd come from a country village, he was living a high bohemian existence in Oxford. I love that. Some things never change, do they? Um, and just, just to talk about his, um, one of the, the collection of um, books that he had with him at Oxford, um, I'd like to introduce the first video from Alexandra, if that's okay. I'm so excited to show you some of the incredible collections we've got relating to Gilbert White from the British Library Manuscript Collections. And among the treasures that we're going to be looking at this evening are some original manuscripts for the Naturist Journal and original letters from Gilbert White to Thomas Pennant, as well as Alexander Pope's Iliad, which he gave as a gift to White. Now, the Gilbert White Museum in Selborne has the original manuscripts for others of White's work, but we're so happy to have many of his manuscripts here, which really complement their collections. So I've got in front of me a really exciting object, which is Alexander Pope's Iliad, which was published between 1715 and 1720 in six volumes. And it's not just exciting because it's the first edition of Pope's Iliad, which I'll show you here. It was given by Pope to Gilbert White in 1743 when White was at Oxford on receiving his BA. And what I love about these volumes is that when you look inside, Gilbert White's written, given to me by Mr. Alexander Pope on my taking the degree of BA, 30th of June, 1743, Gilbert White, Oral College, Oxford, six volumes. But these volumes also reveal more secrets and even in 17, well, 1743, Gilbert White, as a student, was quite happy to write in his books. And you can see he's recorded a chess score. And he's got the name of the players, who's won, who's lost, and stating the date of the game of March the 26th, 1746. And even more excitingly, Gilbert White was notoriously shy and refused to sit for portraits, well, allegedly refused to sit for portraits. And there's been lots published on whether there are any likenesses of him. And these volumes show little pen and ink drawings, portraits of White when he was a student at Oxford. They were made by his friend and you can see there's a larger pen and ink sketch here. And towards the end of the volumes, a much smaller portrait of White, um, again from around the 1740s. Now, one of the other things I love about these volumes is they were given to White by Pope in 1743, when White was essentially starting his career. Now, Pope died the year later in 1744, and Pope was born in the 17th century. And when we talk about degrees of separation, these tiny objects actually connect us here and now in the British Library boardroom with Alexander Pope in the 17th century. And you think about their provenance going from Pope to White, all the way through 18th and 19th century collectors and with us now. And it doesn't take much to take us back to Pope and the 17th century. And the British Library actually also owns Pope's original manuscripts for the Iliad as well. And we've got some of the sketches that you actually see published within these small volumes. Um, and it's fascinating after, after what you've said, um, Richard, about his life at university and how he was you know, living up this bohemian life. You can see it being played out on the notes in, in those books, can't you? 
Yeah, the the um, the presentation by Pope himself is is very fascinating because it's not at all clear um, how Pope knew White. Um, their families um, had various points of connection, but um, it, it's almost as if his family used those connections to kind of say to Pope, "Come on, come and let's give the boy a treat." Um, certainly, there were high jinks around his uh, his graduation. He he notes in his account book that he spent eight shillings on on dinner um, the, the, the the night he graduated, which is actually a, uh, something like eighty pounds in today's money. So he had a night on the town. Um, <laughs> and later in his life, Pope Pope comes in in another way because um, in his garden um, he experimented with lots of the kind of things that. Pope wrote about in terms of, of landscape design. Uh, he, he, he created all kinds of follies, the funniest of which is, is six, six bar gates uh, seen in perspective going up a hill. Um, so in some ways, you know, I think he was taking the mickey out of the picturesque movement, but um, that's not another link with Pope. I think that's I think that's really interesting this interaction um, and there's almost a conversation because you you mentioned well you touched upon at the beginning about how he's often seen as this um, stereotypical country parson um, and you I, I will quote your own words at you and um, living a somewhat tranquil simple wholesome and unworldly life and um, how does that reputation tally with the reality from your point of view? Um, it, it scarcely tallies at all, except in the, in the superficial details that um, White found it very hard to settle. When, he'd left, when he left Oxford, he drifted about um, taking various curacies um, and then went back to become proctor at Oxford. Um, and he wanted his burning wish at that time when he was in his late thirties was to um, become a permanent fellow at Oxford. He wanted to become an academic, but because of some rather murky or rather imaginary murky history in his family, the belief amongst people in Oriel College that his family had a great deal of money and, and White was going to come into this, he was denied his fellowship. Um, a decision that was exacerbated by the fact that he, he kept refusing uh, remote livings in pokey little Northamptonshire flatlands. Um, and uh, so he drifted. And um, there was a period in his life when, uh, contrary again to another myth that he was actually not just wedded, but welded to Selborne, when he went touring Britain, um, he went up to the Yorkshire Dales, he foraged for sea kale down in Devon, um, he spent six months in, in Ely, in East Anglia, um, I think, which was a very uncomfortable time for a man used to the hills. Um, and uh, so, so he, his, his reputation um, as uh, a, a, a really solitary cleric um, isn't psychologically true, but it becomes literally true um, later in his life when he abandoned all hopes of getting a, a proper living for himself in a parish that would suit him and settled for the curacy at Selborne um, and dug in, um, but compensated for that kind of isolation by, by this uh, increasing outgoing grasping for intellectual contact with people with, of, of, a, of a similar train of mind to him. Um, and so began the letters to the zoologist Thomas Pennant that uh, began the natural history. Well, we'll, we'll come on to Pennant um, in, in a moment. Yes. I, I, I want to ask you, um, before we move on to the, the next, the next um, short video, just about the, um, this, this growing sense that must have been within him of, of the natural world and what he could possibly do about it and, get, and how he could engage with it. Are there any early indications of this within his within his writings or his, his life story? Yeah. Um, before he begins any writings that we can get our hands on, before he begins his various journals, he was obviously writing quite vivid, naturally inclined travel journals of his trips about Britain that I, that I just uh, mentioned briefly. 
And we know this because the most important person in Gilbert's life was his best friend, uh, Mulso, John Mulso, another cleric. Um, White's letters to Mulso don't survive. It would be the greatest discovery um, in, in this kind of era if they were ever found, but I'm sure they've been destroyed. But Mulso's replies, which are wonderful, witchy, um, barbed fencing foils with White himself, do survive. And by a kind of reflection, you can imagine what White was writing to him, um, which were obviously vivid, witty accounts of his journey through the countryside of Britain and his growing interest in the uh, organic ornamentation of that country. And I, I think now might be a good point to, um, we will go into detail about them, but maybe a good point to frame his achievements just for people watching so we can just get a sense of what it, why this, this man is important. Would you be able to just outline, you know, kind of tick off the things that he, that he did? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> um, well, uh, if, if, if you start with uh, the, 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 the profile of public interest in him, I mean, it's reputed that the natural history of Selborne is the fourth most published book in the English language. Um, that may be apocryphal. I've tried to work it out and I'm not, not at all sure it's, it's, it's necessarily true. Uh, but that means that the, the number of editions that have been published, that, that virtually every year since publication, somebody has reinterpreted or re-edited the Natural History of Selborne. And it's a, it's a fascinating um, insight into the, the history of ideas about ecology. Um, to read the introductions to the different editions of, of, of Gilbert <laughs> White, introductions by people like uh, like Richard Jefferies and Coleridge, and uh, um, anyway, so so that's how he's seen publicly. From from my point of view, I I, I think he marks a crucial turning point in writing about the natural world. Firstly, because um, he gives it a kind of attention that endows it with agency. Um, these are organisms, creatures, even plants. White was a great botanist quite late in life um, that had lives of their own. They weren't simply subservient to our life. They weren't just objects in our life. They were subjects in their own life. That was a radically new perspective on the natural world. Um, and White, more than that, had, had, had sympathy with them. Um, on the, the very first published natural history note that he makes um, is about the life of the field crickets that uh, inhabited one of the fields below his, uh, his church. Um, and it's a very touching, vivid account of these creatures, the noise they make, their lovely golden stripes on their bodies. But the most exceptional thing about the account is the way white Ex extracts them from their holes on a piece of grass because he, he did not want to damage them. And this is, uh, this is exceptional at this time in, in, in the 18th century. I'm not excusing White on other occasions. I mean, he, he, he did plenty of shooting of birds that plundered his orchard and he was constantly receiving carcasses of various hapless mammals and birds from people in the village. It's great community exercise in taking it down to the Reverend White to see what he made of it. But right through that, there is, wherever it's possible, an attempt to respect the lives of, of even humble creatures like crickets. And the third thing why is, impo is important is, is the radical way in which he translated this new attentive vision um, into words. Um, the extraordinary structure of the natural history of Selborne, which is a, uh, a series of, of, of letters, some of which are completely fictional. I mean, uh, uh, about a third of them were never sent to the recipient. He was using a structural device, um, which was similar to some of the, the epistolary novels that were being written at the time. And the, as for the journals, we'll come on to those. They have a, a, a particular magic in their literary construction of their own. Well, we'll, we'll, move, we'll move on to the, the next video now, which looks at the, um, the Naturalist's Journal. Um, if we could go to video two, please. In front of me, I've got one of a number of volumes of the Naturalist's Journal, which was actually produced for White by his friend, the Honourable Danes Barrington. And actually, you can see in the inscription in the very first of these volumes, it says Gilbert White, 
1768, the gift of the Honourable Mr. Barrington, the inventor. And this volume, or this set of volumes, are really sort of they encapsulate White and his career. These volumes contain set out squares and dates which allowed White to record all of the things that he saw around him in Selborne. And for each date and year, you have a day and you're able to record the weather, the temperature, trees, plants, birds, insects and miscellaneous observations. And when you start looking through these journals, you actually get a sense that this could be a journal for us today, and we could look out of the window and look into our gardens or from our balconies and make similar observations. And I think that's one of the most amazing things about White is the language he uses and the observations that he makes really bring us to the here and now as well. Um, for example, in 1769, on the 25th of March, frogs croak, spawn abounds. Um, young cucumber swells, the great bed heats well, sowed some melons as well. Goose sits while the gander with vast acidity keeps guard. So I've got here um, the page open for 1769 for June and today, which is June the 21st, we see vast rain, cold and wind. And he says quite a winter's day for June. I think we all know what that's like. And what's lovely as well is that on the next page, he's talking about young hedgehogs. And he says young hedgehogs are frequently found four or five in a litter. At five or six days old, their spikes, which are then white, grow stiff enough to wound anybody's ha wound anybody's hands. They, I see, are born blind like puppies. And what's really lovely about White is his language. He's observing these animals, these creatures, and they're alive and they're living near him and he's looking at them every day. And it feels in direct contrast to many of the other collections, uh, the scientific collections we've got at the British Library, which show drawings of specimens of animals that are no longer alive and were dissected. And so actually reading 18th century observations of creatures that are still alive and flourishing in their natural habitat is incredible. And you'll see sort of the marrying of this throughout the Naturalist Journal. For example, on the 25th of June, he says, cuckoo sings and it's raining, but it's also fine. And on the next day, next, the 26th, the next day, he says, kidney beans and young cucumbers hardly survive, no cucumbers for some weeks. Um, and again, this sort of drawing together of animals, of fruit, of vegetables and weather, and you get a sense of, an entire world around white and not just sort of singular objects, singular animals or singular events. Um, I, I wonder if we, we if we keep in mind the, the description um, from Alexandra from from the books, then how radical was this way of writing about animals at the time? And was he aware that he was being radical in his writing? Uh, hmm. It, 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 it was radical. It gets more radical. I, I'll come on to a, some later entries, I, I think, in a minute. But the, um, when Barrington started this idea of a nature journal, he sent the forms to Gilbert White to fill in. Um, he, he made it clear that it had a very practical purpose in his eyes, you know, that it was to build up a picture of the nation so that the processes of agricultural improvement uh, could become more effective. Um, it was a very utilitarian idea to start with. And I think White, White took this idea and uh, ran with it into, into quite different regions. Um, and I, I uh, the, the, uh, what Alex uh, showed there, I mean, it, it was some wonderful entries which show his meticulousness of observation. Um, uh, and the, those records, um, of, of even, even the records of, of the temperature and wind speed and such like um, are incredibly valuable now because they pr provide a, uh, a yardstick by which we can um, estimate the degree to which the climate is changing now. 
because we have ne something nearly uh, 30 years of continuous observation of, of the weather. But when it really gets interesting is when white becomes less interested in those early columns and becomes more interested in that last column of miscellaneous observations. And gradually that begins to swell as the years go on and completely overwhelm um, the more mundane details of uh, which bird had arrived and which had. If, if I might, I might like to read you one from about three, three years later. Um, and it, it shows to me um, the particular technique which White had in his journal entries. And this is for September the 22nd, um, in uh, three years after the ones we just heard. Tops of the beaches are tinged with yellow, heavy clouds on the horizon. This morning, the swallows rendezvoused in a neighbor's walnut tree. At the dawn of the day, they were all together in infinite numbers, occasioning such a rushing with the strokes of their wings, it might be heard at a considerable distance. I love the use of that word rendezvoused, um, but it was that, that contrast between this extraordinary precise indication of autumn, the yellowing of the leaves, the heavy clouds, and then the swallows are there exploding against that background so that you could actually hear the clap of their wings. And it's this technique, it's almost haiku-like in White's journals that he uses time and time again of taking um, a, 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 a snapshot of the surroundings to very precise details, and then against that, something profoundly active happens. And I think that was, that was extremely original and certainly in, in the writing about the natural world it was. And I, I think this moves on nicely to a question that I was going to ask a little later, but I'll ask it now. Um, let's, let's be rebellious. Um, <laughs> about this, the literary way that, that he writes and its legacy. I mean, even in, in the books that you write, nature writing is a, is a beautiful, form of writing it's it's an art form and it's a genre in itself could you tell me a little bit about that link and how that relates to to white yes um i i think that uh nature i think is to do it well is fantastically different difficult and I, i'm not sure um very many of us do it particularly well um, because what you have to do, uh, if, if, just let me go back a bit, nature writing as such um, is different from natural history writing in that the observer is in there um, with, uh, with their particular feelings and inflections on what they're seeing. Um, in that sense, White is poised between being a naturalist writer and a nature writer. Uh, but the poise is absolutely crucial. Um, he is always in there. You can sense his personality in almost anything of any length that he writes, uh, but he never obtrudes into it. He never puts himself um, willfully into the picture. He is there as a passionate, engaged observer, not as a subject of his own writing. And the more you understand about his, his own life, about his perpetual indecision about getting married, which his great friend Malsa was always ribbing him about, um, about his uh, difficulty in um, finding a job, that, that kind of insecurity finds its way into the way he writes about other creatures. He never anthropomorphizes, but it is there, you can tell, by the kind of things he pays attention to, that this is a man to whom singularity and family um, have particular meanings, particular emotional meanings. The most, the most wonderful uh, pieces in the natural history of Selborne um, are his essays on the, the swallow and house martin tribe, um, where he describes their, their whole family life, um, the places they nest in the village, the industry of their work, um, and most of all, how wonderful it is um, to see the Swifts on a better June day than today, <laughs> screaming through uh, the streets of Selborne and how awful it is when they go. The most, the one point where real emotion um, obtrudes into to White's 
writing about these creatures um, is the terrible depression he gets when they've all gone. And I think it's one of the reasons that um, he half believed that they hibernated in Selborne, that they, uh, they flew up into the, he knew, he knew migration happened. Uh, he knew report, reports from his brother in Gibraltar that they'd seen swifts flying, flying over. So he knew it happened, but yeah. somewhere in his heart, he, he liked to believe that a few of them stayed behind in his beloved village. Um, his summer guests would also be nestling down there for the winter. So I think, I think a man who, for whom that, that sense of, of being embedded in a community um, finds its way, it trickles into the way uh, he writes about everything else. It's it's a real the way you describe it there. It's just it sounds like such a special bond that he had with with the natural world. Um, I, I I'm very aware that we are running short on time now, so I'm going to move to the next the next video, video three, which is um, um, some of his letters to um, Thomas Pennant, please. So I've got a volume here of thirty letters from Gilbert White to Thomas Pennant. And what's amazing about these letters is that they formed the basis for Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne. And they start in 1767 and go up to 1773. And what's just so lovely about these objects or letters is that although they form probably one of the most famous books to come out of the 18th century, in Britain at the time, and indeed in centuries afterwards, you actually get a sense of their origins, the book's origins here. And as letters, they were folded, and you can still see the lines where the letters were folded. And you can see the seal on them, and you can see the address, to Pennant Esquire at Downing in Flintshire, North Wales, a single sheet. And you can see as well that Gilbert White is also saying 10th of August 1767 at Selborne near Alton Hance. So again, you're placing these people in physical locations and these letters are going between the two of them. So one of the things about these letters as well is you can see that they are written in iron gall ink. And Iron Gall Ink, you didn't just buy ink, you had it mixed up or somebody would mix it up for you, or you'd mix it up yourself. And you can see as you go through the volume that the ink looks different and that's because obviously White had access to different types of ink. And some of it is more acidic than others. And so in this first letter, which is August the 10th, 1767, you can actually see how the ink is starting to eat through the paper. Now that's because of the acidity in the iron gall ink, and it makes it harder for us to read the letter. But you can see the beginnings. Sir, nothing but the obliging notice you were so kind as to take of my trifling observations in the natural way when I was in town in the spring. And your repeated mention of me in some late letters to my brother could have emboldened me to have entered into a correspondence with you. And it's the beginning of this, these words, it's the beginning of this correspondence that you start seeing White evolve and talk about his natural surroundings. And even in this first letter, as to swallows being found in a torpid state during the winter in the Isle of Wight or any part of this country, I never heard of any account worth attending to. Now he's talking about birds, he's talking about migration. And as we know, it's these words again that actually really helped later scientists will actually understand about the movement um, of birds and their migrations. Mm. Um, just just before I um, ask you some questions, Richard, just a reminder to those watching to please submit your questions um, to Richard about um, Gilbert White. Um, there will be some time to, to um, answer some audience questions towards the end. Um, Richard, um, I'm living right now about 20 minutes from where um, Pennant would have been living at the time. I think his house was destroyed in the mid 20th century. And we're communicating via the marvel of the internet um, from very different places within England. Um, you know, we have, that, we have that connection, but that connection was there as well in the 18th century. This was a world of letters and writing and keeping contacts for, for long periods of time. Could you tell me about that relationship between White and Pennant and how 
the process of letter writing enabled um, White to put together the natural history of Selborne. Yeah. Well, White, White um, got uh, in, into a relationship with Pennant um, because Pennant wanted to use some of White's observations for the uh, uh, for the book of zoology he was he was writing, um, and White was very gratified by this um, because not only did, did he feel the need to have his interest and intellect ratified, um, but it gave him a lifeline out of Selborne. It's very important to imagine uh, the, how, how isolated Selborne was. Um, there were only about two roads into the, into the village and the, the, the main one was the hollow lanes that Gilbert White described um, very graphically in some of the letters in the book, which were 18 foot deep tunnels, um, which were flooded in winter, um, filled up with snow whenever it did, um, and made access to the village very difficult. So it's, in some senses, White, White was trapped in Selborne um, when he was actually in, 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 his, in his later years. Um, and having the opportunity to write letters um, was, was a huge way, was the best way, obviously, of keeping in contact um, with the outside world. Um, people came to visit him uh, occasionally, his best friends, but uh, um, the, the, uh, what, what I find fascinating is uh, that this, this idea of a book based on date line, on letters, date line Selborne, um, they are journalism in, in the very best sense of the word. And that they immediately, by being that, by being uh, having the address of Selborne, become a collection of letters about a community, a community in which people lived uh, alongside many other different creatures and organisms, and a community which, ha which had an address um, and addresses the sense of things being in their right place um, is crucial to what, what the development of White as an ecologist. Um, he, he understood habitat, um, he understood where things belonged. Don't just to go on to the, the, the creation of the book, because I know we haven't got very much time. It's, mm -hmm. it's really fascinating that uh, when he began to, I think quite much earlier than he let on, to have the idea that he might do a book, um, he, he must have started keeping copies of some of the letters before he sent them. Um, and so at the, at the end of the process, he had to start getting some of the letters back from the people he'd sent them to. Um, but the idea of, of, of a, a, an epistolary account um, of, of his life, or the, the life of the community, um, was taken to uh, really quite extremes. And, and he wrote a lot of false letters, um, which were never sent to their recipients, um, to cover various other subjects which would otherwise be missing from the overall picture given in the natural history of Selborne. So it's really quite a, quite a radical kind of literary device there that, um, I mean, there's another one of the uh, avant-garde things that uh, can be credited to him. I think I, that is really interesting, but you can see how it would work from a writer's point of view. He's obviously somebody that's got, um, I don't know what the, fr the phrase would be, but he's got lots of interest. So he has a, a kind of, a, a, he likes to look and be involved in lots of things. So having this letter device, you can see how it would be useful for somebody yeah. with that. I would say, would say one thing. I mean, it, it may quite possibly have germinated like that simply out of laziness uh, <laughs> he wanted to write a book and what was the uh, the best reservoir of, of material for it stuff he'd already written um i think that that, that may have been uh, may have happened at one stage in the uh, germination of the book um because white was undoubtedly uh, a procrastinator uh, again mulso is repeatedly ribbing him for not finishing the book before and it took him about 20 years to write let's face it one one not desperately long book so um one has to possibly put into the equation that, that there is a mixture of uh, pragmatism and inspiration in casting the book in this form. <laughs> I think that's I think that's a very fair point, but it's 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 readable. Things are readable when they're put in a kind of episodic, yeah, episodic way. Um, so the book was published. Um, could you before we move on to the, the questions from the audience, could you touch a little bit on the legacy of the book and its importance? Um, so, I mean, it's a big question, to, mm. me, to be honest, but it was um, it, it didn't take off terribly quickly. Um, 
it, it was well received when it first came out. It was published by uh, Gilroy's brother Benjamin in, in London. Um, and it was sent, uh, I think they did about 800 copies in the first print run. Um, and it was, wasn't until sort of about the 1830s that it really took off when the whole idea of the countryside um, as a reservoir for English values uh, began to be talked about a lot in, in, uh, amongst the literati and amongst cultural commentators in general, because we were beginning to then to have the, uh, the agricultural revolution being uh, countered by the uprisings of Colonel Swing, and the countryside was in a, in a state of tumult. Um, and I think that just as today, we sometimes rather idyllically look to fantastical views of the, of the countryside as a refuge from uh, the travails of the real world. Um, so they did in the 1830s. Um, and White's book was again, somewhat caricatured as being a pastoral idyll, um, which I think nobody who read it closely could ever really believe, but, but that, that kick-started the book. And from, from that year onwards, from, from the 1830s onwards, uh, we begin to get a stream of editions of the book in which large numbers of, of commentators, both on this side of the Atlantic and several from America begin to add their interpretations of White uh, to an introduction. And it, it, it became, I think, pretty much until, uh, what should we say, until the post Second World War days, um, it became locked in this caricatured idea that it was a, a, a book of, of country wisdom by a person who, to whom, I, I'm trying to remember one dreadful um, introduction which compared White to a spaniel um, sporting through the hedges and as it were sniffing out um, scenes uh, as if he was a dog or singing like a bird, you know, anything other than imagine him to be an intellectual who was working quite hard at getting a new vision of the world. And I don't think that, that, that interpretation of him didn't really begin to come through until the, uh, the post-war years and people like Geoffrey Grigson um, looking at White and, uh, and seeing him for what he really was. That's so interesting. He's almost uneasily kind of packed into this romantic movement of the 19th mm. century and um, didn't really, yeah, the, the nuance we had to wait for, but obviously we can, we can read all of the nuance and all of his, um, about his fantastic life in your brilliant book, which just to remind people will be reissued this, um, this October. But we'll move on to some questions from the audience now. Um, I have a question here from Patricia and she asks, how did he get some things so wrong? For example, barnacle geese. Um, if, if you lived in a time when um, uh, it was thought that all kinds of metamorphosis and transmutation were possible, and at a time when very few people had done what White had done, which was to actually go and look firsthand at what was happening in the natural world, rather than reinterpreting what uh, some of the classical and medieval authors had done, um, I think it's very easy to make a mistake like that. That uh, you know, the the the, uh, the idea was that uh, geese, um, when they weren't here um, in the summer, um, turned into barnacles, which then eventually hatched back into into geese. <laughs> um, these days, it doesn't seem so fantastical. I mean, the uh, what we're learning about ideas of metamorphosis in the real world, um, in some of the extraordinary transmutations you see amongst insects, um, a shellfish hashing into a bird is small feed. <laughs> um, I have another question here. Um, what was your impression of White as a clergyman? Um, was he a shepherd of his flock, inverted commas, um, or evangelizing, an evangelizing Christian, or was it more of a reluctant formal business for him? Well, I have to say that having, having spent quite a few years in his company, um, it is very hard to find any evidence of White evangelizing the Christian religion, except um, on Sundays when he 
uh, he preached some really rather routine sermons, which don't read as if they're written by the same man that was completing the Naturalist Journal. So uh, even though I have no doubt he was a, a, an undoubting believer, um, that, that really didn't stray into his, uh, his picturing of the world at all. He's not constantly um, explaining the, the mysteries that he was discovering by saying this is, this is God's work. You know, he, he wanted to know why these things happened, um, not that they, they, they were simply received messages sent from above, given uh, bodily form. So um, he, he, was, uh, he was both a typical uh, intelligent curate in that his life was lived uh, way beyond his uh, conventional duties. I mean, most of the important scientific work in the late 18th and 19th centuries was done by clergymen, by, who were the amateur scientists. There was no such thing as a professional scientist in those days. And the large number of these people were, were clergymen. So in that sense, he was conventional doing this business. But in the, other, in the sense of being a conventional Christian, um, I find no evidence of it. <laughs> He didn't get his creative juices flowing. Um, so um, I have a question from, from Monica here, and, and she asks, I know Danes Barrington was a judge as well as an antiquarian, but how did he encounter Gilbert White? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, I think White, White uh, I'm, 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 my memory has failed me on this one. Um, White met Barrington uh, really quite late in, in his life. Um, didn't, I, I think, met him just once or twice. Um, and um, it was Barrington's um, in, enlisting of White's help with the Naturalist Journal that was the main reason for their, uh, their initial contact. Um, um, uh, it's very interesting to compare the, the, the two correspondents, Pennant and White. Pennant was very, very much the, uh, the, the zoologist, the scientist. Um, Barrington was much more the travel writer. And he had very much uh, less exact ideas about the natural world than either Pennant or Gilbert White. He had, he had some fantastical ideas. The idea, you know, he, 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 he disputed migration at Barrington. Um, because he said, I have never seen a bird flying higher than St. Paul's Cathedral, therefore migration cannot happen. Um, that was a kind of uh, opinionated um, and not terribly well read man Barrington was. Um, and I think uh, Gilbert, Gilbert enjoyed writing to him because he could show off um, and put Barrington in his place from time to time. <laughs> um, we have a question here about punctuation which is unusual but um it's i think it's a good question when it comes to white the fact that um um he um this is from james he mentions that in one of your um in your analysis and i'll uh, forgive me for um, mispronouncing this her white's entry when he says horindo domestica and puts three exclamation marks there which gives a sense of his delight at the return of the swallows well, I'm, I mean, is there anything to say about, about his use of punctuation? I was reading before that apparently he was the first person to use a cross as a kiss in a letter. Um, but I just, I just wondered if you had anything to say on, on that. Um, yeah, I, 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 liked the, um, I liked the cross and the kisses, which was uh, after an extraordinary um, episode in, in Selborne when, when various uh, teenage heiresses from London came down and spent the summer there and they, they played out Greek myths on, on the uh, on the hills. Um, yeah, using that that triple exclamation mark, um, I, I I will willingly be uh, be educated here. Uh, it, it's the first occasion I've seen it used um, in a in a piece of natural history writing. Um, and what is really interesting is the way it was subsequently adopted um by uh, writers as an indication that the person writing had seen this themselves um it's a, it's a conventional uh, mark in 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 in, in uh, county floras and county books of birds that uh, if you've seen the, the bird yourself at a particular place in a particular time you put an exclamation mark in but um it it, it may occur in earlier books and if, if I, i'd love to be pointed towards them if, if it has 
Oh, that, that, I think that's really interesting. Maybe that's a, that's a challenge we can set our, ourselves, audience um, attendees and attendees and us as well. Um, but just a, a couple of final questions before we draw the evening to a close. Um, Richard, what advice would you have for anyone wanting to write about nature? Two things. Um, and it's to do with uh, what I think is poss possibly our greatest current nature writer, Tim D, um, says, which is to do with the, the outside and the inside. Um, that is that you must pay fastidious attention uh, to what you experience and what you see, um, and that you must pay fastidious attention to the ways those experiences have been rendered by other people. So you go out a lot and you stay in a lot reading. Um, and I think that the, uh, the second one is as important, that um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure anyone can ever write well without reading well. Um, and I, I would ap apply that to nature writing. That may seem contradictory, you know, that, that, that something which is absolutely in its essence to do with attention to the outside world um, that should also require uh, a cultivation of the inner voice. And that is best done in conversation with other people who've been in that situation. Um, and then my, my final question to you, you may not be able to talk about this if it's a book, I don't, I, I, you know, that's fine. But what's next for you? Have you got, have you working on a project at the moment? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm trying to work on a project. Um, I'm not sure I've really got a great deal more left to say. I hope I have, but um, when I have an idea, then I suddenly find that I'd already explored it 20 years before. <laughs> but what I would like most to do, um, and it will need, um, it needs a structure, is I'd like to write a fairly critical philosophical book about um, the use of the word nature, um, which seems to me to have begun to fray at the edges in a really quite alarming way. Um, like everyone saying, we need to reconnect with nature during the pandemic when we were already being subject to the greatest connection with nature that our species has had for several centuries. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to kind of place that in, in a kind of meditation on, on the word nature, what we mean by it, but done, um, uh, done in a grounded way by perhaps um, perambulations in our garden here, um, which has many man manifestations of the wild and the cultivated and the different graduations between it. Um, and I, I fancy that I might do it as a series of letters because uh. that, that conversational tone that you can get in a letter, where you're really talking to someone, not just expressing things to yourself, is very special. Um, White did it, and um, I, I might have a go myself. Oh, that would be fantastic. And the, the next question would be, and you really do not have to answer this, is um, who you would write the letters to, maybe maybe White. Um. <laughs> um, yeah, I might like White write them in a false sense, but I have a couple of friends who I might pin in the corner as the recipients. <laughs> I'm not telling you who they are. <laughs> Richard, this has been such a treat and a pleasure. Um, Thank you for joining us and best of luck with the reissue of the book. Um, it's a, uh, honestly, it's a fantastic read. If you haven't read it already, do get yourself a copy because it just, it takes you away. Not in an, not in, not in an idyllic way. You do, you feel connected to, to White's life through it, but um, thank you. Um, and thank you to the audience for watching as well. Thank you, Rebecca and Alex and, and everyone who's been involved. It's been great fun. A huge thank you to Richard, Rebecca and Alex for that fascinating discussion of Gilbert White's life. I do hope you've enjoyed tonight's event. Just a reminder that if you want to buy the biography of White, you can do so using the bookshop button just above the video and you can also give us your feedback. I'd also like to thank Gilbert's White House who've supported this event and I hope you'll be able to find the time to visit them there. Um, we've also recently reopened the British Library in our St Pancras site in London, so if you'd like to come and use the reading rooms or look at our exhibitions, please visit our website to book your tickets. Thank you and good night from the British Library. <laughs>